All right, good morning, everybody, again. Grab a Bible, we'll study. Grab a Bible, we'll study. Yeah, good to see you, man. Okay, good morning again. Thank you for being here today to, to share your life with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we have some guests here today, some uh, maybe first time or second time or third time attenders. Glad you're here with us. Uh, we do have a care group that meets uh, today at lunch uh, back here in the cafeteria or the cafe gymatorium, whatever that is. And uh, you're invited if you're of care group seven, I believe it is. And, uh, and then guests, anybody that wants to join back there, if you're, you're new on the scene, join them, connect with a small care group, and, uh, and you can deepen your friendships and deepen your Christian life with that. I have a couple of announcements to make this morning. The first one was about class. I know Wednesday nights, Kevin Brewer, uh, Amanda Reams, Courtney Singleton, some others, and Kirk uh, are making a fantastic youth group class happen on Wednesday nights. So if kids have not been coming to that youth group class, come on out on Wednesday nights. Uh, I know they're doing Sunday classes too, so, uh, so do that. Also, adults, we have a number of Sunday classes uh, at 9.30 every Sunday. And so if you're not making a class, you've got three or four different options. You've got kind of a roundtable discussion in the back, and you've got Kirk Reams in the class over there, and then Randy's in the class. We've even got a college and young professional class back here. So make a class on Sunday. Deepen your Bible understanding. And that brings me to the slide on the screen. Uh, this is um, our challenge for the next couple of months. That's it. If you want to get a nice, easy, beneficial challenge, then this is the one that you want to jump in on. Starting tomorrow, which is the 18th of October, by the way, the reason I know it is because today is the 17th of October, and it's our anniversary, uh, 30, 30 years of great, 34 years total, but 30 years of great marriage. Um, Anyway, so tomorrow, tomorrow, make sure you, if you haven't got a, a way to, to read through the scriptures, we're going to try as a church to read through the New Testament beginning tomorrow. A lot of us will use this schedule that's on this website. It's called crosstownfamily.org. You click the ministries drop down box, Bible reading challenges, 365 days. And then you scroll to October 18th, and, and it's only going to take you about seven minutes a day to read from now till the end of December through the whole New Testament. Of course, we're studying uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, so we're going to camp out on that during our classes on Sunday morning. I'll talk about that some as I speak from here. But do your best to read some Scripture and if you want to read through the New Testament with a whole bunch of other folks doing the same thing by this schedule, plug into that. A couple other things we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate that we got to go to the fall fling at the Randy and Darla Reed Ranch yesterday. woo It happened after a short delay, and it was a fantastic afternoon. God gave us some great weather and some great chili and some great stew, and great food, fun, and fellowship. So I think we should applaud because that was a fantastic. Thank you, Randy and Darla, for hosting that. Every year, if you get to come out, you just get to sit around, and there's fishing and and hay, hay rides and all kind of fun stuff. It's a great gathering every fall. Something else we need to celebrate today, today was the official day that Arliss Vandeveer stopped teaching his Revelation class because they're finished. <laughs> After three years of study, I actually love that preacher man and love that you've been digging deep into that book. Thank you for all your, your study. He was uh, instrumental in a book being produced a number of years ago on the book of Revelation with visual aids and all that. And so he's been taking a large group through that for, for a number of months. And they've all loved it. Okay, keep talking good about Arliss, he's saying. And he's handsome and he's okay. Anyway, thank you for all you teachers, adult teachers, class room, classes for kids. Thank you so much for your dedication. 
as we are gearing up, even shifting into higher gears all the time in church, as we are gathering again together in, in greater, greater numbers, we just thank you for being a part of this family and celebrating with us, crying with, with us when that's necessary. So thank you for being a part of God's people. Um, I got a call this, well, last night, George Holland, who was a member of the church here a number of years back and had moved to the Metroplex. He passed away last night. And so if you want to contact that family, we'll have more information about, about his passing and a funeral coming up this next week. So uh, keep that family in mind for sure. Okay, um, Luke chapter 3 and 4. Now, I know this is a little bit behind schedule. I know that the class has jumped ahead where they're supposed to be in Luke chapter 4, but I had to back up to chapter 3 because I got hung up in chapter 3. You ever been in, a, in an area where there are just ruts that go along and, and you find out you can handle the ruts pretty well until they get really deep and then you hit high center and then you get stuck? You ever been there before? I got stuck in Luke chapter 3 because there were some words that I was digging into that I want to share with you today just to give you a deeper concept of of why these things were happening. So here's going to be our reading for this morning. We're just going to read Luke chapter 3, and it's 1 through 6. And then we're going to talk about some of the words there. Because every word, I think this is right, every word in Scripture was intended to be there. Not only by the writers, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, write this word next. And it gives it depth like no other book. It gives understanding like no other book. And there are other books on the shelves out there that give you some pretty good insights to Scripture and to Christ and the church. But none like this one. This one stands far apart from those. And so we're going to look at some of these words in the context of what's going on here. Here it is, Luke chapter 3, 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate became governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis. It makes me want to sneeze when I say some of those. Trachonitis. And Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. Okay. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, which you know, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, hundreds of years before, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall, hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Pray with me right there. Holy Father, thank you for bringing us the salvation that you had promised for so many years and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ that has changed the world. And if not the whole world, Father, it's changed us. God, thank you for bringing that salvation story to life in the person of Jesus Christ. It's through him that we pray. Amen. All right. When you see the word wilderness, if you're a Jewish audience and you hear that John the baptizer comes into the wilderness and he starts teaching this thing called a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, if you're a Jewish audience and you hear the word wilderness, you flash back to what the people of God had to go through for 40 years. Coming out of bondage in Egypt, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now, while they were in the wilderness, they had it tough. They had it rough. In fact, the wilderness was a tough place. 
they were not only people who had been in Egyptian captivity, but they had given in to the Egyptian gods, and they were worshipers of that, and they were giving them to Egyptian ways, and they were doing that. And so God had his work cut out for him with these people in the wilderness. But here's what happened in the wilderness. God introduced himself to these people in a very clear way for the first time to say, I am a God who's providing for you. Now, do you remember the story? Remember what happened? The one time that they were saying, we're so hungry, we're so hungry. And he said, well, I'll just have some, some uh, croutons fall from the sky. I'll have some biscuits, maybe some gravy on the side. Let me just rain down manna. You guys just go out and pick it up and you'll have all you want. And then I'm going to send some quail. Man, I love quail. A little bit of fried quail. Never hurt anybody. But enough quail for everybody. There may have been a million people out there. I am the God who provides, God says. And then they're thirsty. And he says, okay, Moses, go over there and, and, and speak to that rock. And one time he says, strike the rock. And, and all the water a million people need. And they're learning God is fulfilling his promises. God is saying he's going to take care of us. And this is the God we're following. This is the God we're going to worship. This is the God we're going to dedicate our lives to. Now, the Jews know this story. It is ingrained in them. And the Gentiles know a little bit of it, although their ancestors weren't involved very much. And then John comes baptizing in the wilderness. And when the Jews hear that word, they think, Something powerful is about to happen. It's been 400 years since any prophet has come on the scene. And John says, let me tell you about the Christ that's coming. I'm unfit to even untie his shoes. This guy's going to change the world with his sacrifice, with his example, with his teaching. And everybody, it says, came out to John to be baptized. Everybody from the Jordan to be baptized of John. And so the easy correlation is made. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord, and he was introducing the Christ that provides. He provides salvation. Now, let me just do a little bit of thought provoking here. What if you were a businessman in this first century? And your business was selling sheep and goats and lambs for the slaughter, for the forgiveness of sins. And John comes on the scene saying, no, 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 no. The blood of Christ from now on is going to be taught that it forgives sins. No more necessity for the slaughter of all those animals. Now, if you're a rancher like Randy Reed and you hear that nobody needs your animals anymore, you're going to be pretty hot. And a lot of people got pretty hot at John. In fact, a little bit later, they threw him in prison and then cut his head off. I guess that was not a good way for a, a preacher to survive is to preach things that, that people don't like. But this is just the beginning of a story. He's crying out in the wilderness. And physically, here's what the wilderness looks like then, perhaps looks like now. Uh, I looked this up after that Greek word wilderness. It's a solitary, lonely, desolate place, void of comfort, a desert or deserted location, harsh and unforgiving. Okay, so when we hear the word wilderness, that's the scene of the first baptismal record of John saying, Things are new. Things are different because of the blood of Christ. Not just physically, but spiritually. And here's what the rest of that definition of the word wilderness says in script. People are deserted by others, deprived of aid and protection, deprived of friends and acquaintances, a flock deserted by the shepherd, a woman neglected by her husband. You see, when Scripture uses the word wilderness, it's not just talking about someplace out in the country. 
someplace where the woods grow so thick you can't see through them, or some desert, or some jungle. Scripture is talking about the wilderness amongst us, the wilderness that so many of our community are living in right now. There are people that we bump into every single day that are lost in the wilderness. Some of them don't even know it, but they are lost. They are outside of God's will. They are outside of a clear path. They are outside of God providing for them. They're outside of hope. They're outside of peace. They got nothing. And we run into them every single day. And so the message that takes place in the wilderness is the same message for us today. There are people that are lost. And Christ said, I have come to seek and to save, and to save the lost. Have you ever been really lost? I mean, we've got GPSs right now that have taken the places of our wives. You know what it's like to be lost in a big city. I've been lost here a number of times. I want to tell you a short story of the first time that I was actually really lost in the woods. Back in college, I came home from college to my dad. He, he lived in Emory. And dad and mom had a nice little uh, Christmas. I think it was maybe it was Thanksgiving. And uh, dad said, let's go hunting, son. I found a place on the topo map. Out east, it's some kind of wilderness area, and it's, you know, we can go hunting there. I said, let's go. So he wakes me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Every college kid loves to be awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning. And we head out there, he, we're, and then we end up on a dirt road going north, and he stops. He said, okay, open the door. It's still dark. Go about 200 yards that way, and I think there's a valley. Might be a great place to sit. And he says, I'll meet you at 10 o'clock right here on the road. I did. It's dark. I'm stumbling through, and I'm hitting limbs and all. I've got a flashlight, but I'm still trying to make my way. And finally, a few hundred yards in, I I find a little slope, and I sit down. Nothing happens until 945 when something moves, and that's me. I finally move, and I think, this is crazy. I've not seen a thing. I'm going back to the truck. So I start walking. And I realize I have no clue where I am. I've got no clue because the the valley was kind of turned a little differently than what I thought. So I started walking the wrong direction. When you're lost, the first thing you say and the first thing that I say, the first thing all you men say before we listen to our wives, of course, is I've got this, right? 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 I got this. Oh, you took a wrong turn. That's right. No, I got this. I got this. I'm taking a shortcut. That's what you usually say. We have so much pride in ourselves. We say, I got this. I don't need any input from anybody. Not even that girl's voice on the GPS. By the way, you can change that if it makes you feel a little better. I was lost. And I thought, I got this. So I'm walking through the forest. And I'm going 200 yards, and I'm going 300 yards, and I'm going 400 yards. They have moved that road. I think they did. And I'm lost. The second thing you think about when you're truly lost is, I'm going to run for it. If I run, I'll cover more territory, and I'll get there quicker, and I won't have this feeling of anxiety, and I'm, nobody's going to know that I was ever lost in the first place, and so I'm going to run. But what happens is you fall in ditches, and you fall in creek beds, and you fall, if you're hunting, and if you're running in real life, you're, you're making decisions, bad decisions, faster and faster bad decisions, and you think, I don't have any comfort. I'm going to keep buying stuff to make me more comfortable, and then all of a sudden, you're in trouble financially, and then, oh, wait, wait, I've got to do this thing to get out of that, and then you're in more trouble. You start doing things faster at a bigger pace, and you say, I've got this. I've got this. I'm going to do this by my own will and by my own ability, and, I'm, and you're rushing headlong into chaos, and after I ran for a bit, 
Now I'm sweaty. Now I'm hungry always. Now I'm deeper lost than I was before. I still got no clue where I am. And then here's the, first, the third thing that comes to your mind. Well, you we went too far. You cry for help, don't you guys? Don't you women? Sometimes you cry for help. So that's when I stood still and started yelling, Dad! And he doesn't answer. Nobody answers. Nothing makes a noise around me. And I'm yelling and I'm screaming, where are you? Where's anybody? Somebody come and help me. And I've got nothing. And when you're in the world, you do start crying out for help. You do start saying, I, I, I need some assistance. I, a lot of people you know have asked you for assistance. A lot of people have shown themselves to be not in control in a lot of ways in their life. A lot of you have, shown, have been shown that there are people in need all around us and they're crying for help. I even had one suicide note that I had to read and I said, okay, this person's crying out for help. A lot of people don't want to commit suicide. They don't. They just want somebody to read the note to get some attention because they're crying out for help. That happens every day. And then here's what you end up doing. You pray for a map. Man, if I just had a map. Here's what happened in my story. I was standing there. It was getting later in the day. I had no clue where I was. And I remember there was a word, a word that flashed to my mind. I remember in East Texas that, that moss grows on the north side of trees. So moss was the word that I thought about. Moss! I remember that. I turned and looked in every single tree. Now, you can see it around town. Moss is growing on the north side of a lot of your homes, by the way. If you didn't know that, you know, let Buddy Wiggins know he's got a uh, water pressure thing. He'll take care of that. Um, moss. I started looking, and every tree had moss on the north side, not on the south side. I had read that in a book somewhere. And I remember that I was going north on the road. So if, if I walk west, I'll hit that road. I walked a hundred yards to the west, stumbled on the road, looked up the road, and about a mile away was my dad sitting and drinking hot chocolate in the pickup truck. There's one word that our culture needs that it's our job to say to them. Actually, it's one name that John would say right after this. It's the name of Jesus Christ. It's the name of a fellow that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. I am, as God said, and Jesus said, I am he. And it's our calling to realize, just like John, that there's a wilderness around us and there's people lost in it and their lives are crashing, their lives are caving and they don't have a map and they're running and they're screaming out and we are called to be that answer. That's where Moses came in. Speaking in the wilderness, introducing God. That's where John came in, introducing Jesus. That's where Jesus came in. God is sharing his revelation, his answer, his word, so that people might be saved. And that's where we come in. 2 Corinthians, it says, 5.20. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I had to pause right here because the next scene is Christ and he comes. And he meets John and John baptizes him. And the first thing he does, he goes out into the wilderness. Because he knows that in the wilderness, you can have a close relationship with God. If you're open to that. And that's what we're praying for the people around us. And then he spends 40 days with, with God. And then he knows the word that, that will serve him well as Satan is tempting him in the wilderness. He, 
He is asked by Satan, you know, do this, do this. And he says, it is written. It is written. It is written. And that's our calling to say to those people in the wilderness that we bump into every day. It is written. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus will provide. Jesus will take care of you. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. You lost. Jesus wants you to be found. And the only way you'll be found is to come to him. And that's the message. How has Jesus changed your life? How has he made it better? Now I'm talking about you're going to get rich if you follow Jesus. I'm talking about you're going to get rich in faith, rich in peace, rich in joy, rich in hope, rich in love. All of those things that matter most. And it's our job to bring that message, that one word or that one name, Jesus Christ, to people in the wilderness. I pray this year that you're getting geared up to reach out 